have people joining. So my introduction will give a bit more time for, for the audience to, to be uh, assembled. My name is Amy Bogart and I'm head of the School of Archaeology and delighted to welcome you to this special public lecture. And it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Shadrach Chirukure. The particular occasion that we are marking with this event is the publication on Monday this week of a new book entitled Great Zimbabwe Reclaiming a Confiscated Past. And the uh, many registrations that we've had for this evening's lecture, I think reflects the anticipation with which this book will be received. Since 2019, Shadrach has been British Academy Global Professor here in the School of Archaeology in Oxford. He also holds the post of Professor and Director of the Archaeological Materials Laboratory at the University of Cape Town, and we're delighted that his colleagues at UCT could join us this evening as well. Shadrach completed his PhD at the Institute of Archaeology at UCL in 2005, and we're pleased also that there are colleagues from UCL joining us this evening also. Shadrach has won numerous awards, including a Shanghai Archaeological Forum Research Award in 2019. That's one of 10 that are awarded globally every two years. He is also, I believe, the only person to have been awarded the Antiquity Prize for Best Article of the Year twice, in 2008 and again in 2019. The 2008 paper in Antiquity represents, I think, his first published work on Great Zimbabwe and gives us some indication of how long he has been rethinking the archaeology of this iconic, world-famous site. And so, without further ado, I will hand over to our speaker, Professor Shadrach Tirukure. Uh, thank you, Emmy. Let me try and share my PowerPoint. Uh, Robin, can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. It has just your icon at the moment. Uh, OK, let's try, let's try, let's try again. Uh, how about now? Yep, that's I can see your PowerPoint now. Yep, you just need to share it large. OK. Great. Uh, thank you. Today uh, marks 136 um, years, 18 days since um, the Berlin Congress um, took place in Germany um, on the 15th of uh, November in 1884. So that obviously had um, repercussions for the uh, African um, continent, including uh, the knowledge uh, production um, domain. So the big question then is that um, how might we reclaim um, some of that uh, past um, that was um, dismembered, um, you know, through uh, the uh, Berlin uh, event? Very big question, of course, but um, if you may allow me to deviate um, a little bit from the Western tradition and um, do it uh, the African way, and I hope here the technology will uh, work. I would like to uh, play you a song, and one of the things Professor Bogart uh, forgot to tell you is that um, sometimes I'm a DJ. Here we go. It isn't playing for us yet, Shadrach. Mm. 
someone has suggested that you need to remove your headphones for us to hear it. Sorry? Uh, somebody in the chat has suggested. There it is. Robin just said that you guys did not pay the DJ, so unfortunately the show has to end here. But uh, what Thomas Makumo is saying in um, this song is uh, beautifully and philosophically. He is uh, posing a very big question that speaks to uh, intergenerational uh, transmission of, uh, of knowledge. So uh, one of the key questions that he is asking is, um, you know, what is the role of um, indigenous African ways of knowing and uh, ways of doing um, in our everyday lives? And to add on to that, uh, how can we use that knowledge um, to try and um, understand um, the deep past, which then takes me to um, why this book? and also this uh, music by Thomas Mopumo and, and, and others. Um, I draw from it at the, at the philosophy. So the writing this book was um, purely by accident. In fact, I had a book which was um, ahead of, uh, of this. And um, so what happened is that um, after giving a number of presentations, sometimes mentioning the word uh, decolonization, but and others are not mentioning it. Um, a number of colleagues were saying, look, you always um, say that um, let's decolonize, let's decolonize, but um, how do we actually do it? How do we, how do we achieve it? So that then became um, a big um, challenge, uh, building on a theoretical and academic infrastructure established by colleagues um, and uh, as well as my former mentors actually uh, and um, so Webandoro, one of them as well as um, Sabelo Gachen and Lohu and, um, and, and, and many and many others. So the key question then uh, became is it possible for someone like myself who grew up um, in a very tiny village in southern Zimbabwe, um, the name of the district being Gutu, to use the experiential knowledge that was acquired growing up to try and interpret Great Zimbabwe and then have a conversation um, with other knowledge forms. So that's what uh, the book is all about. It is um, to a great extent um, very experimental. When I started writing it, I didn't know how it will end. So if you are surprised, um, by how um, I will conclude, you are not alone, even myself, I'm also surprised by, by that. So the main idea um, around uh, all this is um, the um, thinking or the provocation um, that um, Great Zimbabwe has neither been a local nor an African affair. It represents um, a confiscated past initially by antiquarians and subsequently by professional archaeologists, uh, both black uh, and white, including, including myself. And um, this is the idea that um, runs uh, through, uh, through the book and which speak to the um, debates around, you know, producing usable knowledge and also uh, producing what my, one might call a decolonial um, knowledge. But the key question then is, is that achievable? And um, how might um, one uh, achieve that? So to do that, um, we need to um, take this in a modular kind of um, uh, approach. There are things that we need that we know about Great Zimbabwe. Some of those things we need to unlearn them, right? There are things that we need to relearn. 
and there are also things that we need to uh, to learn. So, in uh, if we achieve that, then we will have um, set uh, a theoretical and a methodological um, context for you know a subsequent um, interpretation. So I will share with you uh, some of the highlights in terms of um, the theoretical um, thinking that um, shaped my thoughts. Um, as the writing process was um, going on. So first of all, um, the reason why I'm saying um, or I'm putting up the provocative uh, statement uh, that I did is that um, after 1874, when uh, Great Zimbabwe was drawn to the attention of the Western world by Colmock, uh, um, the what is known as the Zimbabwe controversy um, began, and um, that is uh, associated with uh, the uh, thinking that Great Zimbabwe was not a uh, local in um, origin; it was uh, foreign. Um, it was also um, a site of uh, gold uh, mining and um, and other um, activities. So that marked at the beginning of um, the confiscation of Great Zimbabwe from the local communities and the general uh, public in, um, in Southern Africa. Great Zimbabwe then became associated with um, a specific uh, elite, um, including um, none other than a Cecil. Uh, so other than the well-known, well-publicized um, issue of, um, of origins, um, the entry of uh, professional archaeologists, uh, Dave Randall McIver and uh, Gertrude Carton Thompson, um, was quite a major uh, boost for professional archaeology in the sense that they applied um, current uh, methods, current um, within the context of their time, um, to uh, study Great Zimbabwe. And then they said, well, it was local in origin. But the results, of their study were not uh, presented in the uh, neighboring uh, villages like Mugabe's village, Nemano's village, um, or Charumbira's village, uh, for that matter. The results were presented in Cape Town. Um, they were presented in, um, in London. And also the books uh, that were published, they were also for that, um, for that market. So you can see why I am talking about, you know, this is a past which has been taken away from the uh, indigenous people and is now um, playing out um, differently and severally in different um, localities. So after the um, 1950s, 1960s, um, the then fashionable uh, new archaeology um, promoted uh, some theorists to apply some of its tenets to uh, Great Zimbabwe, the idea that archaeology is a science, you uh, come up with hypotheses, test those hypotheses uh, through experiments, uh, through you know data, and then you can validate that. So that was good in a way, but um, bad in many others. Um, one of those then was at the tendency to privilege the science over other knowledge forms. So for example, one of the uh, perhaps unintentional or even maybe intentional um, outcomes was that um, there was the impression that local narratives only make sense when interpreted by archeologists. And um, that then dislocated Great Zimbabwe from um, indigenous communities. So it was a science for the archeologists and then and, and for the communities, um, never mind, um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But of course, um, the way in which archaeology has um, or is evolving uh, as a discipline um, makes uh, it imperative that we uh, discuss these issues and try to uh, pose uh, some uh, questions and where we have answers, uh, provide uh, those answers. So Peter Gallick, one of um, the most um, important uh, archaeologists in the development of uh, African archaeology. When this model building started in the early 80s, he um, raised a flag and said, mm, are we not um, 
swinging the pendulum maybe in the wrong direction. And um, where are the um, indigenous African archaeologists? Uh, can we have um, their village experience? Can we learn from their ways of knowing and ways of doing to try and you know create um, a more um, perhaps democratic uh, conversation rather than the one where you know the archaeologist and the science you know um, was uh, supreme. Martin Hall also um, uh, contributed to this uh, to this discussion. So Zimbabwe got independence in 1980, resulting um, in the um, development um, of um, a number of uh, colleagues, um, most of who uh, actually also uh, uh, trained me. So, which was actually a very good, uh, a very good thing. But archaeology is also a cumulative science. You build on what is um, on what is there. So, what also happened was that um, as archaeologists, we then tended to um, continue with. Um, uh, pre-existing knowledge, even without, uh, you know, uh, without questioning. So um, this meant that um, the uh, tendency to marginalize communities and also to challenge them as, you know, non-experts, as well as people without an understanding of, uh, of science, it also uh, continued. So this then marked the separation of Great Zimbabwe according to the uh, local communities and Great Zimbabwe, according to the, um, to the academics. So then this further supports, um, you know, the question that, you know, um, maybe we need to ensure that the academy uh, finds uh, the community and uh, starts to uh, treat them as um, a very important uh, constituency in what we do. Then the big question is, um, how do we reclaim a confiscated past? Um, that is um, a big question, which um, uh, a number of colleagues, Sabelo Gacheni Lohu, um, has also uh, theorized on this, as well as uh, many, other, many other colleagues. But I want to highlight um, the uh, theoretical contribution of uh, the Cape Verdean um, revolutionary and philosopher um, Emil Cabral, who uh, had um, this theory of uh, a metaphoric um, a class a suicide. So, where, um, of course, I had to reinterpret it um, within my context, then it became um, is it possible for African um, archaeologists and um, anthropologists, as well as allied um, um, specialists, to sacrifice, you know. Um, our position as the elite um, and also the positions, the privileges and the powers that come with that to rewrite uh, a history informed by local experiences, philosophies and, and an understanding. Is that, is, that, is, is that possible? Is that asking? Is that a big ask? But um, of course, um, um, in one way, um, what it is a very high sounding and it is also noble. But the reason why many people have not uh, tried uh, doing it means that um, it is not um, an easy thing to do. And one of the reasons um, was put by um, the uh, political scientist uh, Pata Chatterjee um, in The Nation and its Fragments, where he talks about the uh, post-colonial contradiction, where we are trying to, in some ways, challenge the a knowledge uh, which was um, constructed by the colony, but also using um, the tools of the colony. So that um, in a way becomes um, a counterintuitive, you know. Um, so given this um, contradiction, then there are many other uh, suggestions. So Amy Cesare, uh, for example, um, said that, well, in some cases we might actually, uh, we actually don't need to uh, move back at the at the clock. What we need to do is to perform um, a critical uh, analysis and then uh, be in a position to uh, select what works from what doesn't work. We build on to uh, what works um, to build, you know, inclusive paths and so on. So that is the approach that I uh, took uh, in the book. I remained faithful to the 
uh, disciplinary fundamentals of archaeology and anthropology, but I also um, dipped into a knowledge, some um, which had been considered peripheral or some which had not played um, a central stage in um, swinging the pendulum of um, interpretation particularly as far as uh, Great Zimbabwe is concerned and also Great Zimbabwe's um, implications um, to global archaeology. So what I also um, have done is to come up with um, a local indigenous concepts. So there are some terms um, that philosophical or otherwise that make sense in English, but when you translate them, uh, into uh, Shona and other African languages, um, the meaning is lost. Or when you translate Shona into, to, into English, the meaning, the meaning is lost. So what I try to do then is to um, come up with um, uh, an array of um, African concepts um, and uh, philosophies, um, especially regarding territory, uh, time, and I drew that from, you know, music, language, proverbs, poetry, and, um, you know, oral literature, and, 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 and different forms of, um, of local knowledge. Um, the idea was that um, there might be important information that we can use to try and um, inform uh, the way in which we um, breathe life into the lifeless um, remains uh, from, the, from the past. And one of the um, central uh, spans which I sought to uh, break with this concept revision and, um, you know, approach was um, this idea that started in 1931 with the Southern Rhodesian uh, Missionary uh, Conference, which um, divided um, the people in uh, what is now um, Zimbabwe into different um, ethnic groups. Um, so the, those um, in the north uh, we, we, were labeled Kore Kore, the southerners were, you know, labeled Karanga, and, and, and so on. And um, according to the linguist um, Herbert Chimundu, this was uh, a great deal of um, invention of, um, of tribes and, and, and tradition. And um, it has no uh, historical validity whatsoever but it was an artifact of the different mission stations uh, working or operating in uh, different parts of the country. So for example, the clan uh, where I belong, uh, the Gutulufura people, um, originated uh, from just north of Harare around uh, the 1830s and moved down south um, to Agutu, um, which is now in Masringo province. So from where they come from, they, the area is Kore Kore Stroke as a Zulu, using uh, the current um, tribal classification. But then they are now in the south, which is uh, a Karanga territory. So they are now Karanga, which means we are talking of the Zulu Stroke uh, Kore Kore people who are now Karanga, right? And then the archaeologists, what we are doing then is taking the labels from the Southern Rhodesian Missionary um, Congress of 1931 and then extrapolating that to identities that existed around AD 1000, you know. So the Karanga, you know, uh, built a great Zimbabwe and, 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 and so on. Well, maybe a question for another day is, um, is which Karanga? But what I'm trying to say here is that um, the, the, the application of um, the labels which are taken from the, you know, from the colony and using them to interpret um, the uh, pre-colonial past perhaps is uh, one of those um, unmitigated um, inventions of, um, of, of tribes and tradition. It is counterproductive and um, it hinders um, a much more creative uh, engagement with, um, with the past. So what I try to do is to say, hang on, um, here are the here are the complexities. Identities are malleable. Identities are fluid, and also identities are situational. So, um, in as much as Great Zimbabwe is um, is Shona, um, attributing it to one specific uh, tribe uh, defined in 1931 um, 
it um, it is very brave um, in my view. So I use those concepts. Uh, some of them I will um, elaborate as I uh, proceed. So we have set um, the context. We have established the concepts um, that we are going to um, to use. Um, time, I will also engage with it um, further down. But there's also another important thing that we need to understand, that Great Zimbabwe is a very beautiful place. It's breathtaking. It's nice. It's stunning. Wow. What? The problem is um, that um, in most cases, discussions focus on the period AD 1000 to 1600. That is when, you know, the walls were flourishing and then the like. But no one really uh, bothers to ask what happened, you know, after 1600. And more importantly, after 1874, after Kolmok, up to the present, what, uh, what happened to the landscape? What changed? What has not been changed? So because that is also material in how we build interpretations. So I also present a biography of Great Zimbabwe through um, interviews, through archival research, um, and uh, these are the so the 720 hectares um, on the map indicated as Great Zimbabwe Monument. It was arbitrarily um, demarcated um, in 1893. It has nothing to do with uh, uh, you know the boundaries of Great Zimbabwe in the past, but it was also an attempt to balance. Um, as imaging settler uh, land uh, interests and and, and 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 so on and then um, in, in, you know in terms of partitioning um, it ended up being 720 hectares so we need to keep that in mind when talking about Great Zimbabwe its size and how it interacted with uh, the outside um, world so the other thing that happened is that um, with um, the um, declaration of Great Zimbabwe as um, an, uh, a national monument or its predecessor after, you know, 1902. We then see that uh, Great Zimbabwe became um, a Western uh, place. Its constituent elements, um, the hill ruin was named the Acropolis after the Greece. The camp ruin after the British South Africa uh, company because they camped there um, at some point. Poselt, uh, one of those um, um, individuals that um, collected some of the first material at uh, Great Zimbabwe, um, Renda as ruin after George, um, um, after Adam Renda, and then uh, the Phillips ruin after uh, George Phillips, and, and, and so on and so on. No local name, no indigenous name uh, whatsoever. That also speaks to the confiscation uh, that I mentioned. And also, there was the idea of um, the monumental bias in, in early uh, archaeological uh, thought, whereby the unbuilt settlements were not considered important. What mattered were the built up areas to the extent that this um, lovely building here, which is um, the uh, curio shop at, um, at, at Great Zimbabwe, they sold some very nice stuff. But the issue is that it's built on um, a very important deposit of, uh, of houses. So there is an accretion of, uh, of flows in these um, house flows in this, uh, in this area. When this was built in the 1970s, um, and this is right at the entrance to one of the uh, main uh, world complexes, uh, the U complexes, the thinking then was that maybe um, unwalled settlements, you know, they are not as important as the walls. And also, um, there are a number of other things that were added um, in this and un, un, onto this unworld landscape. Um, the a golf course, um, for example. Um, so if uh, in the 1920s or thereabouts, um, you, could, um, you could go and, um, and tea at, uh, at, at Great Zimbabwe. And uh, also later on, there was a prison, um, and there are many, there are many additions that have affected, you know, the at uh, the landscape. So taponomically, then this is all important in terms of, you know, if we are to build an interpretation of, you know, the activities that were taking place in the different areas at Great Zimbabwe. So this is at uh, the uh, site museum, 
um, the eastern side, which was built right uh, on top of the camp ruin, just to um, um, demonstrate uh, some of the attitudes uh, that uh, you know were prevailing uh, back um, back then, and also to say, Great Zimbabwe um, is um, a mobile um, collection which is uh, scattered all over. That uh, soapstone uh, bird. Um, if you are in Oxford, um, its replica is the one uh, that sits on top of um, Rod's house. The original is in um, Cecil John Rhodes' cabinet of curiosity in Cape Town. So there is material in the Pit Rivers, uh, in the Museum of Anthropology um, in Cambridge, British Museum, and, 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 and so on. So that is um, the story of, um, of Great Zimbabwe. It is, in fact, um, world heritage, and it is also um, a world um, a collection. Then um, if we have established um, these uh, preliminaries in terms of um, establishing a solid uh, background, you know, we have, um, we tried to unlearn some things, um, we learned some new things, but another a fundamental um, thing is um, chronology. So without chronology, it is very difficult to understand um, how are the events, um, activities, that took place um, during the everyday um, or occasionally uh, at Great Zimbabwe, you know, we, it then becomes very difficult to, to understand that. But the key thing is that the chronology of Great Zimbabwe in recent years uh, has been um, highly uh, debatable and also um, uh, controversial um, for the reasons to do with um, uh, ideological um, uh, standpoints of the uh, different uh, researchers and so on. But what I was interested in, and uh, I must also um, be very grateful to the uh, reviewers that I got um, uh, for the book, because I had uh, sort of um, avoided the issue, but then the reviewers insisted that, no, 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 you have to give us um, an indigenous concept of chronology, time and change. Can we have an African version? You know, and can you reconcile the two? So what I then did was to uh, build um, an archaeological uh, chronology and also uh, think about, you know, time from an African, point, African concept point of view. Um, and uh, the outcome was quite uh, uh, interesting. It might also be um, uncomfortable um, to some, but that is also the point uh, for, for discussion. So time amongst uh, the uh, Shona people uh, is known as, um, as Ngua. And the philosophy that I used, um, I also got it um, again uh, from, uh, from music. I hope uh, this uh, uh, plays out. The legendary uh, late Oliver Mtuguzi, uh, the song is called um, Rirongere, and um, what he is saying uh, summarizes um, one of the uh, major uh, philosophies of time and uh, also continuity and change amongst uh, the, uh, the Shona. So what he is saying is that um, the past is not always in the past and the present is not always in the present. <laughs> so there is that um, feedback uh, look. Some might say, well, this is um, a secular uh, view of, um, of time. But what it does, um, it raises very important questions such as, you know, what does the sedimentation of um, um, soil, you know, into uh, those layers, um, what we call stratigraphy um, at um, archaeological sites, such as Great Zimbabwe? What does it mean locally? And, 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 and 
can we reconcile it with the fact that, you know, the past is not always in the past and uh, the present is not always in the um, in the present. So, kare agarar kare, nas arambar nas. And, and, and which is also important because um, ancestors, um, the living dead, um, amongst the uh, Pichona and uh, many other groups, they play a very important role um, as sources of wisdom, as protectors, um, and, and, and many other purposes. So they lived in the past, but they also live in the present and um, they influence the future. So the present generation, they are also present, but they also become the, the ancestors and, 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 and so on. And so the cycle, the cycle goes on, which is um, very important in the way in which um, generations are interlinked. So uh, what I also try to do then is to provide a reading of the stratigraphy that aligns um, this um, local conception with uh, some archaeological uh, thinking. Whether that was successful or not, um, the jury is, um, is out. And one of the um, important things uh, archaeologically here is that um, um, a great deal of work, um, great work, I must uh, emphasize, resulted in the uh, periodization of the um, occupation at Great Zimbabwe, starting with period one, uh, period two, period three, period four, and um, period, uh, period five. So what has happened is that, um, depending on who you read, um, the period um, AD uh, 1200 and um, 1450 is considered then to be uh, the most um, important associated with uh, the flourishing of Great Zimbabwe. What happens before that and what happens after that um, is uh, irrelevant or is, um, is minor. So then um, that raises the question that he, uh, Wobbs and others, um, I mean, Martin Wobbs uh, here, uh, the archaeologist, um, the question that he then raises is that um, the way sometimes we come up with um, archaeological periods and the way in which we define our layers, we create a series of unrelated others where in the case of Great Zimbabwe, period one is not related to period two, period two is not related to three, three is not related to four, and four is not related to, to five. And yet, um, if we go back into the local philosophy, local histories, the great and important work by uh, Gerald Mazarire and others, it's showing that there is quite a great deal of continuity and change. Just that archaeologically, we haven't fine-tuned our methods to achieve that resolution, which is quite uh, which is quite important. And the other thing, and here I thank um, Chris Gosden for um, numerous uh, discussions um, running um, through miles of um, rural uh, Oxford. Um, I also see that uh, Richard Bryant is uh, tuning in, um, and also Miranda. Thanks, guys. So that's my uh, my running team in uh, in Oxford. But what came out of uh, some of the discussions um, with uh, Chris and others is um, there is this um, bifurcation that you know African time is secular and then uh, Western time is linear, it's a rectilinear, and also um, it uses gadgets and and, and, and and so forth. So the discussions that I had. Um, with uh, Chris, they made me realize that actually the Western time and African time and you know Pacific conception of time is all secular. So the uh, conviction that Western time is a uh, linear um, is um, actually trying to look for essentialism or Western exceptionalism, which does not uh, which does not work. And I draw your attention here to one of my uh, favorite um, uh, poems. Uh, John Keats, um, you know, the Ode to uh, Autumn, Seasons of Mist and um, Mellow Fruitfulness, um, close, uh, bottom, close um, bosom body of uh, the uh, maturing sun. And uh, towards uh, the, uh, the end, um, he, uh, Keats also asks about, um, you know, um, about spring, uh, spring, where are you? Um, so 
even if you are in the West, you still have this thinking of, uh, you know, summer, autumn, winter, spring, and you also have, uh, you know, uh, season after season, year after year, and that is a cycle that also uh, repeats, um, repeats itself. So once, um, once, that is, once that is done, it also allows um, some possibilities in terms of, um, you know, interpretation. So the um, issue then is that um, what I did, of course, there is a lot of um, radiocarbon uh, dates, um, some uh, Bayesian modeling. Again, I need to acknowledge uh, the contribution and input of uh, Chris Ramsey and uh, also uh, Mark Pollard. Um, they, 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 they helped um, a lot uh, with that. So at the end of the day, um, what I recommend um, is that we erase the periodization at uh, Great Zimbabwe. In fact, um, one of the latest uh, debates with my aspiring partners, uh, he dared me to, um, to, to say, well, uh, can we do away with the periodization? You know, so I said, yes, we can. <laughs> and then and, and that periodization, what I'm saying is that uh, there's no need to say period one, period two, period three. Rather, we need to understand, to apply um, well-resolved uh, chronologies, high-precision chronologies, to determine when uh, things um, happened, and then um, let loose um, within the constraints uh, imposed by, you know, uh, the statistics, our interpretation of the p-value, and and, and 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 so on. So that is one of the uh, perhaps um, major, if one, if not radical. Um, uh, suggestions that I'm putting forward is to say, well, this periodization, um, given also the limitations that WOPS and others have put forward, that they create a series of unrelated others. So if we are to go into the work of Gerald Mazarire and others, where they show these genealogies of uh, people that are related on the landscape, why can't we try and use that? And then um, this periodization, um, we appreciate it, but then maybe uh, we uh, shelve it um, for a little bit. And then I also applied um, local concepts, um, particularly local concepts of change, um, local concepts of um, uh, continuity uh, as well. And um, with that uh, background then, um, the other thing then was to say, what can we make in terms of uh, the interpretation of Great Zimbabwe? Um, here I was... Um, interested in looking at um, collections, um, excavating areas um, that were marginalized, the unwalled areas and objects in the museums, um, the famous horrendous um, ruin award, which people talk about, but not many uh, know about. So that's what I was, um, what I was looking at and uh, to try and uh, build um, a meaning. So one of the things was obviously household archeology. span the nature of the homesteads at uh, Great Zimbabwe. How do they look like? This is the Shona village, it's a reconstruction, but the assumption is that the houses at Great Zimbabwe would be more or less uh, similar to, uh, to this. Um, but um, these are some of the uh, remains, a solid uh, ethan uh, material, um, solid dagger, and this is uh, a house uh, on top of the uh, camp ruins. You can see um, uh, some of the uh, dagger is uh, still there. We are doing some uh, petrographic studies to analyze uh, the uh, properties to see uh, how, you know, what made it so durable, what made it uh, so strong. But um, thinking and uh, about uh, the... Uh, the houses, uh, these are the uh, different uh, features, and uh, this is also um, uh, the furniture in the, um, in the, in, in the houses and, and, and so on. So, uh, Professor Bogart, some of those uh, statistical calculations um, that you were talking about, yeah, one can apply them um, in terms uh, of uh, the arrangement of furniture and um, a use of space and so on. So, there's quite a lot um, to be, um, that is discussed in terms of also association between different areas, um, the house flows, middens, and activity areas, particularly from the point of view of crafting um, and other everyday things. Where do we find gold working? Where do we find copper production? Where do we find weaving? Um, and, 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 and so on. So all that is um, associated. Then the other thing um, is that the, uh, our homesteads um, 
Sometimes they um, comprised of, um, you know, the um, earthen um, houses, uh, which are inside the, uh, the stone walls. And these are some of the stone walls. So uh, Andoni Witi, uh, Schofield before him, um, and, and then others, they've done a lot of work in terms of um, wall classification. So there is uh, the classification that um, the P style is the earliest, followed by PQ, uh, and then Q, and then R, that's the uh, latest um, um, or the last uh, stage. Um, Q represents the epitome, the zenith, of um, stone wall uh, construction at Great Zimbabwe. And these are some of the walls um, in, uh, built in Q. Um, uh, about um, six meters, uh, in some cases, two meters wide, four meters wide at the best, and uh, also 11 meters high. Very, very, uh, very impressive. But the key question is that using local cosmologies, local ways of knowing, what is the equivalent of P-style walling, Q-style walling, and so on? What you then find linguistically is that uh, the e is the word uh, Mashingo, dry stone walls, uh, Mashingo. They are also known as um, Mazimbawe or, or, or Zimbabwe as, as a singular. There is no, uh, nothing like, you know, this is beautiful. So aesthetics is not, is not, is not uh, a variable in terms of classification. However, um, the occupant that this um, enclosure was occupied by so-and-so, that makes the place important, even if the walling style is not um, aesthetically uh, pleasing. So that is also something that uh, comes out um, uh, strongly and uh, also is used uh, to uh, support uh, the way or the thinking that um, power might have been um, widely distributed, uh, dispersed um, within uh, this um, network of um, a settlement within the um, within the town. Uh, that's speaking on some of the uh, early writing. What I also um, do is uh, to think about um, the objects, material culture from uh, Great Zimbabwe, such as um, uh, ceramics, pottery. And here I pick on uh, an idea which um, Web Bandoro wrote about um, in uh, 1996, where um, he was saying, well, why don't we develop um, a local typological classification of pottery and um, apply it to the archaeology and uh, then uh, compare the results um, to see if there are any similarities and, and, and differences. So that is um, what um, the uh, discussion on, um, on the pottery is, um, is all about. Um, what we did is also we classified the ceramics into uh, functional types. But here I also revisit much more empirically um, the uh, connection uh, or the thinking in Southern African archaeology that um, you can identify ethnic groups on the basis of ceramic uh, decoration. So this pot is, um, is, is from South Africa and uh, particularly amongst uh, the Tswana. So the thinking there is that if you see this design, then this is a Tswana, this is a Tswana port. Um, and, and, and that's um, a classification that pervades through uh, some archaeological thinking. Martin Hall and others uh, have challenged it. So, and, and as I mentioned, Web Andorra also, also challenged it. So what I also uh, say here is uh, using um, much more detailed um, empirical evidence, perhaps more than others before me, to question this um, association between uh, ceramic designs and um, ethnic identities that existed um, 1,000 years um, ago. So what I'm interested in rather is that um, how are pots classified uh, locally and um, came up with uh, these um, illustrations. Um, they look ugly. So my colleague Robert Yamshosho must have drawn them. Anyway, I'm joking. Uh, thank you so much, Robert, for, uh, for this. So what this um, summarizes are the different um, uh, category, functional categories, um, as well as uh, size categories with their local names. So what I then did was that um, I then approached the um, ceramics from Great Zimbabwe and then um, I classified them according to this uh, system and according to the archaeological system and also um, compared that and did uh, some uh, petrographic uh, work. 
um, more work particularly on proteomics to are uh, ongoing just uh, to affirm up uh, some of the uh, observations. So for example, um, cooking vessels that, um, so according to our um, classification, if um, a vessel is uh, predicted to, to have been used for cooking, what do the, you know, the proteins and the residues inside the pot are say? So it's a question of, uh, of validation and that is um, work that is uh, ongoing. So local functional uh, system, uh, which we then um, applied. And um, when I was um, writing this, I also took it uh, to the, some of the local community members and talking about Hadganambia and so on. The discussion was um, very enriching when compared to talking about um, short-necked vessels, tall-necked vessels, and, and 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 so on. So as it were, that brought uh, the uh, community into the uh, picture. And then of course, my own bias in um, material science-based um, archaeology is betrayed uh, by this chapter, where I'm talking about uh, craft science technology and um, everyday uh, innovation, I also deep into uh, design uh, theory, uh, particularly from um, an African um, a point of view. Um, so the, um, these are um, some copper based or maybe pure copper, maybe a bronze, um, which were, I suspect, excavated by David Randall MacIver, recovered from, uh, from Great Zimbabwe. The reason why I'm showing these things is that um, in some papers, um, when uh, some colleagues are responding to some of our arguments, they say that these things don't exist. So that's why uh, the book um, has so many pictures. This is to say, yes, 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 the, these things, they do exist, they are there. And we have actually looked at them. And this is what we think um, they mean. So there's quite um, a little bit uh, in terms of um, science from um, a local uh, point of view. And, and, and that is actually one of my... Uh, favorite uh, chapters and I think um, one of the reviewers uh, suggested that well this um, ought to have been the uh, the model chapter then um, I also talk about um, the exotics which is um, one of the themes that uh, um, interests me and um, uh, those uh, that uh, work um, with me um, and uh, I appreciate uh, all their input I learn a lot uh, from them so what do we mean in terms of fame, uh, prestige, and, and, and value? What happens when we uh, conflate uh, fame and prestige? And what are the implications for value? So these are the objects uh, making up the part of the um, renders uh, ruin. A hoard, a Chinese jade teapot, um, a, um, a Chinese bronze bell, a crotal, um, perhaps a lamp stand. They are, there are also other things. Um, some of the material I could not account for it, but this is on display um, in the Great Zimbabwe um, Site Museum. And um, it was just great to realize that, yes, the much maligned antiquarians, uh, they also had the decency. They sold some stuff to Cecil John Rhodes, but they also kept some, uh, for example, um, uh, this one. So um, the objects from afar, what do they mean? Um, what I simply do here is to... Um, emphasize the local factors in a global history writing um, and also ask the question that um, the tendency is to assume that um, objects such as that jade teapot are politically charged. They are objects of power and so on. But um, in terms of uh, practical things, how uh, can a king or a queen uh, use, um, you know, this teapot, you know, to control a territory that is 50,000 square kilometers in, in, in size, so the mechanics of uh, the mechanics of power and and so on. So I do uh, question that a little bit, and also just to revisit the size of Africa to say Africa is a massive, massive, massive continent. Um, when we talk of uh, external trade, in most cases, is the Indian Ocean based trade, is the Trans-Saharan trade, but we forget the internal African trade, such as um, that involving. Perhaps these are iron gongs, whose distribution is uh, from um, uh, Ivory Coast and Burkina Faso in West Africa, right up to the Mozambican coast um, in uh, Southern Africa. And, 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 and uh, there are also those uh, copper ingots 
and it's also external trade. And these objects are also exotic, you know, however, however, however divine. So the story of, of exotics then must also consider the objects from within Africa. And once you do that, then um, the contribution of um, objects from outside to social formations will then assume a completely um, different um, meaning. Then in terms of um, uh, wrapping up, this is uh, the last uh, part, which then says, if we apply the native cosmologies and ways of knowing, what um, can we say about the rise and, uh, and decline of Great Zimbabwe? So again, I tend to emphasize the, uh, local, the local factors, um, you know, religion. And uh, recently there is a tendency um, to say one aspect of um, religion, um, which is described as, uh, as rainmaking, um, was uh, important for its um, rise. But that's um, um, a blatant uh, misunderstanding because um, praying for rain um, is an integral part of a wider uh, universe involving uh, divination, thanksgiving, and, 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 and many other things. And to the right, uh, those are figurines from um, period two occupations at, um, at Great Zimbabwe. So if you read um, some of uh, my critics when they say, no, 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 there was no material, there's no occupation, these are the objects. And this is an excavation by um, Keith Robinson. And also, there's also the debate that, you know, in period two, uh, there were no crucibles and, and, and the like. These are the crucibles that Robinson um, discusses in his um, 1961 paper on pottery. So 2030 BD, that's the official name for, uh, for Great Zimbabwe. And that one is perhaps uh, a mold for, for, garden roller, for garden roller beads. So these things can't be really for, uh, for rain making and, uh, or for praying for rain. This simply means that Great Zimbabwe was a fully uh, flourishing uh, homestead around, you know, just after AD 1000 with the people doing uh, the daily activities. And this is the, this is the evidence. Then there is also um, land control strategies, um, cattle raising, uh, which was also a much more uh, secure way of controlling. And of course, um, these, are, these communities were not in isolation. They interacted with others. So um, gold production, um, ivory trade, it also contributed. But what I do is that I emphasize um, local factors, because if we privilege long distance trade, this, see, in my view, is not different to arguing that Great Zimbabwe is still a foreign, only that foreigners this time are doing it indirectly through a long distance trade. They are not doing it directly as what the antiquarians um, used to think. So this is one of the uh, arguments, slightly philosophical, but um, I thought nevertheless um, worth it. So do social systems um, collapse? That's the question that Nomen Yofi uh, has asked. So the argument is that Great Zimbabwe gradually uh, lost um, influence um, and uh, we can see continuity from um, 1600 um, to 1700. Um, so that idea of uh, a vacuum, um, in my view, it does not exist. And this thinking that Great Zimbabwe was um, a maternity ward or a maternity sanctuary, um, locally uh, interpreted as, um, as Masungiro, as uh, some colleagues are saying these days, uh, that, uh, you know, um, the, the post-1600 um, occupation at Great Zimbabwe are related to uh, the Mutapa uh, people who brought their wives to give birth uh, from 500 uh, kilometers. Um, that is um, perhaps cultural arrogance, uh, cultural misunderstanding. And uh, also, that is the only um, incident where I tried to be, to be cheeky. And I used the analogy of um, Prince uh, Harry and uh, Princess uh, Meghan, um, the Dutch and uh, the Duchess of uh, the Sussexes, as they were, that um, when she was about to give birth, you know, 
her mother had to move from the states um, to you know to be to support. So then, um, what our archaeologists at Great Zimbabwe are saying is that well, Windsor Castle or Frogmore Cottage was are uh, used for you know for maternity related ceremonies simply because uh, you know the mother-in-law moved from Los Angeles to you know it's, 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 it doesn't work. It doesn't work if you if you understand uh, the, the the cultural the cultural system. So I argue for um, for continuity, and I also talk about. Um, Ebenism from uh, a local point of view, uh, what does a dispersed Ebenism uh, look like? And then uh, widen the lenses to uh, think about uh, the, uh, the political economy and ask the question, why is that um, Great Zimbabwe is not really um, in the center of where resources that were uh, fundamental to its flourishing are located? The gold is far away and, and, and so on. And then I talk about the dynamics of, um, of circulation. Then in um, wrapping up, what I do is um, also to say that, yes, Great Zimbabwe might be a Southern African um, archaeological site, but it is global and it has had um, global importance. So two very uh, powerful, very uh, important women in uh, British um, and Imperial archaeology um, Gertrude Garton Thompson, as well as uh, Kathleen Kenyon. Um, so they got their training at Great Zimbabwe. So Great Zimbabwe trained them. And uh, we cannot talk of their contributions at Kaga Oasis um, and also in Jericho and other places. Um, the use of aerial photography, it's all thanks to uh, Great Zimbabwe. So Great Zimbabwe, um, a very important place in, um, in world archaeology. And uh, that's a trend that has continued, particularly um, the work of, um, of Weber Bandoro in terms of, you know, um, heritage beyond uh, the, um, the monument. Um, archaeology also beyond uh, the, uh, the monument. The communities are saying, OK, you archaeologists, it's your monument, but it's, um, this is our shrine. So how might we use then their local knowledge to build uh, these, uh, these interpretations. Again, uh, these are uh, wider um, uh, themes that have shaped their global archaeology and that are coming up from, um, from Great Zimbabwe. So which is why uh, making Great Zimbabwe, you know, reclaiming the past is also um, symbolic within uh, the context of Africa. And also, Jesus Ponden asked the question, you know, in terms of the uh, silence of um, unrepresented past, those communities, um, you know, those ethnographies that we say we cannot associate with uh, Great Zimbabwe, we need to bring them. So this is what I, um, this is what I, this is what I, this, this is what I argue, and I leave it um, that um, that broad. So this then takes me to the uh, to the end um, of uh, of the book. Um, so um, at this point, then, what can I say? Um, what is next? Uh, maybe what I can say is that I have told you the, the most boring uh, things. And uh, if you want uh, the more exciting uh, things, then, then, then you, have to, uh, you have to get uh, the book um, uh, here. It's, 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 uh, it has important information. And if you also um, I think uh, that... Um, the what I was saying is controversial is, um, you know, um, I know um, someone that can um, that can convince you to buy into uh, this story. And um, it is uh, this um, a gentleman uh, here. So with this, I thank all these um, uh, organizations or maybe rather if you um, not um, happy with the presentation, if you don't find uh, the book interesting and so on, uh, these are the people to, uh, to blame because they funded the research and so on. I I'm joking, of course, but just to appreciate the contributions, um, the support that I got uh, from, um, from colleagues. Um, and um, with that, I thank you so much.